So I'm currently traveling right now. Can t someone tell me if my audio is coming across well? Yep, it's working fine. Fantastic. Good morning, folks. Hello. Hey. So let me bring up the chat. If you could go ahead and add yourselves to the meeting minutes as attendees, that would be fantastic. Please note the call is recorded um, starting from the very beginning and will be posted to YouTube. And then um, we usually start about five minutes after to give folks a chance to show up. Is this a copy paste of the list of attendees from last time? I don't think that we have all these people now. Or am I? Yeah, I got a question for you on uh, Slack as well. So, sure. Cool. Okay, it is now five past the hour. So let's uh, 
let's get started. So welcome to the welcome to the December 10th network service mesh meeting. Um, make sure that you add yourself to the attendee list in the document. Uh, the document uh, is shared over the chat. So we have this is a recurring meeting every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. We are also involved with the CNCF Telecom User Group which occurs every first Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific time and every third Monday at 3 a.m. Pacific time. That next call is going to be on Monday, December 16th. So uh, next week, we have the CNCF networking working group, which has been rebooted. They meet every two weeks on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Uh, next call is on Tuesday, December 17th. So immediately after the network service mesh uh, meeting. Major events going on is uh, DevConf in 2020. Um, call for proposals is still closed because it finished. Uh, November 19th, the acceptance letters are going to be sent, but I was told we are still waiting. And um, they did announce that they're going to post registrations on December 9th. Uh, does anyone who is following that know if that happened? Yeah, actually, um, our talks that we submitted for network service mesh got declined. So. Ah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, next time. So, yeah, next time. Um, so a quick question then, are people still intending to, intending to attend or um, did this fight not having talks get in? Um, it's hard to say. I guess it's, we don't have an answer for that yet, but mm, I think not, to be honest. Fair enough. Let's go ahead and remove it from this particular uh, event then. And okay, okay, sure. So we have uh, FOSDOM coming up on the 1st and the 2nd of February in Brussels. The um, uh, the CFPs have closed, and so I believe we're just in a, um, in a waiting pattern for that now. Um, I did speak to one of the organizers. If um, if we do wind up with something that with someone who really would like to give a talk, we may be able to um, we may be able to slide something under the wire. Um, but again, if someone feels strongly, reach out. Otherwise, the the CFPs closed. Oh, yeah, that was nice of them. They're they're super nice people, and FOSDEM is like the least formal conference on earth. It's a good time. Yeah, I, I feel like with conferences, you either want them to be extremely formal in how they're run, or extremely informal. In the middle, this doesn't seem to work very well. It just doesn't set expectations right. Oh, cool. so we have. KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe coming up in Amsterdam in March 30th through April 2nd. The call for proposals closed on December 4th. Notifications will go out in January. The schedules will be announced in Jan January 22nd. There are multiple talks that have been uh, sent in. Please add your CFP to the spreadsheet that is on the list if you haven't. And I don't think I've added mine yet, so I will do that after this talk. And we have um, NSMCon uh, EU 2020 that we're, that we're attempting to, to organize. Uh, we'll have more information on what happens there uh, shortly. Um, we have ON, oh, uh, we have ONES uh, North America that's also come, coming up. The CFPs should open up relatively soon. I don't think we have an exact date yet. Um, and I'm not even sure we have a URL for it other than the fact that it's, that it's going to be announced. Um, as we learn more, we'll post more about it. Uh, do we have any announcements that need to be made? Okay, if there are no announcements, then we will move on to the social media community team. 
I do not see Lucina on the call, so I'll read off what she has posted. Um, we have 612 followers, an increase in 15, and are following 39. We have uh, increased our tweets by 28. We have posted on NSMCon. Uh, I thank you for 600 followers. We posted on X Factor CNFs and KubeCon takeaway retweets. The plan is to post NSMCon videos on online. We want to retweet any mentions that come across. Uh, there is a um, article that uh, it's come out that has uh, NSM uh, mentioned in it and the release notes. And when available, we will sh actually, did we share the, the, the contributors podcast? Did, did that come out? Um, I don't know that we shared it. We should probably give it some social media love. I think it did come out. Yeah, so. Recall. So we should check that. If it if it hasn't come out, then it should be imminent. Like um, it was quite a while ago that we that we did that. Um, LinkedIn account stats uh, are are not out yet, so we have to wait for LinkedIn to provide us with some information. I think. Um, and with that, uh, can someone who was at the Asia call give us a recap on what happened in? Um, uh, earlier in the day, I will do. Um, maybe I will share my screen for a while. Um, okay, so um, we usually use the time for questions, um, and I see that uh, JJ is here. Um, so the first thing, uh, there were a couple of questions around talks uh, from uh, NSMCon, which are online already. I don't know why we didn't do the announcement here, but effectively, yes, this is the announcement. Um, the talks are out. They are linked uh, in, let me just see how to make a call. Um, the talks are out there, uh, seen, Okay, I don't know why I didn't find the Asian call. It was today. Ah, okay, so here. We have a playlist. They're also linked in the um, uh, in the page of uh, the conference. So if you go there uh, and each video, you have all the keynotes, the YouTube video, so you can open and see it. It's okay, that apparently is me, okay. Um, there's also a playlist here. So uh, that was uh, more or less what we, uh, what we started talking. Then there were a number of um, discussions around two specific topics. One is the recent health issues that Ilya is facing. Uh, and I see that Ryan is here on the call. So Ryan, can you? Please quickly update because we were discussing today about uh, what's going on with the support for Helm Tree. Um, so, uh, is this something that we should consider for merging already? How do you feel about the PR there? Yeah. So, um, just kind of a background of what what this PR is all about. Um, I, I first pulled down. I as I mentioned last week, I'm kind of new to NSM, just kind of coming on board. Um, I pulled down. Um, NSM and the examples and started trying to run things locally. Um, and what I found is that uh, my distro, um, which, which just happens to be um, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, is uh, now packaging Helm 3. Mm -hmm. So that version of the Helm client that was landing on my distro was uh, incompatible with uh, the make targets uh, that we have in um, mm -hmm. NSM. So I'm trying to run the examples, things are bombing out, ah, what's going on? Um, so I put together this PR that uh, wraps the Helm client. It looks at uh, what version of the Helm client you have when invoking make, and um, mm -hmm. it invokes the Helm client accordingly. Um, and that's just kind of the first step. I, from, from what I can tell right now um, with my limited exposure uh, to the project, uh, it, it, it seems like this is just kind of the first step to get us going toward Helm 3 support. 
so what this does this this if, if we we're to go ahead and merge this uh what this allows us to do is continue um with uh helm 2 as we've done but for folks who um might be using a distro that starts packaging helm 3 um I, they won't be surprised by things um exploding on them when they try and run examples um mm -hmm. and, and this probably i think this also insulates ci so um if as we move forward and um, start adopting uh, Helm 3 um, in CI, uh, that this kind of gives us a, a bridge to get there. Um, so we don't have to make the jump to Helm 3 right away. Uh, so, so that's the background with this PR. Mm -hmm. uh, now, as to uh, whether we're ready to merge it or not, I mean, I've, I've taken the work in progress tag off of it. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen that it is, um, it, it fails CI in, in different places. Now, I'm not sure if that's related to the PR or not, and that's where I could use some help. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I'm doing something wrong. Um, so any reviews or yeah, what? It, it's, it's probably not strictly related to the, the PR. We'll take a look. We've had a little bit of instability uh, recently in the CI. Um, as you might imagine, when you run hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests across multiple clouds, um, you occasionally run into some interesting hiccups. Uh, my, my favorite historically being when one of the public cloud providers broke their CNI. Um, <laughs> that was that was super fun. Suddenly everything is failing. Why is everything failing? Oh wait, <laughs> because the public cloud provider recommends downgrading to their previous CNI. Okay, we can do that. Um, I will not name it, um, but I really want to. Um, <laughs> So, but yeah, that, that ends up being, um, that, that, that is, you, we'll, we'll have a look, but, but very likely it is not actually related to your, um, your PR. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, feel, feel free to take a look, um, uh, comment on the approach. If, um, I'm headed in the wrong direction, let me know. Um, this is working for me, um, in, in my sandbox. And uh, cool. seems that, to that, pass. That gives it a, a decent chance of actually working. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and it seems to pass through uh, the bulk of CI. It's uh, just kind of a random test here and there that seems to fail. Yeah, uh, that, that 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 that's very good, and I much appreciated. And, and kudos to you guys for already being on Helm three. That's really recent. Um, so, and and I, I very much like that that Helm three Helm three is a great example of a community listening. Because apparently the, 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 what they'd gotten was a whole lot of uh, tiller must die, die, die. Um, and they listened. <laughs> yeah. Tumbleweed is neat like that, though, because they constantly upgrade uh, packages and uh, live, on the, uh, live on the edge from what I've seen. So it's yeah, a I good way to find out but what works. Yeah. Oh, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend Tumbleweed in production. It's a, it's a little too cutting edge. But, um, yeah, for... Uh, for, for development purposes, um, it, it's done well for me, so. <clears throat> um, okay, so um, we kind of got to this because Ila was facing some uh, some other problems there, um, which I think that he's trying to um, avoid and to work around in some other, um, in some other ways. Uh, but what we know is that there is a fix for these issues in the current uh, Helm master and eventually when Helm becomes 3.1 release, which I don't know when this will happen, uh, we will probably, I mean, it's a, it's good that we are already preparing for this, but we will probably want to adopt 3.1 when it gets uh, uh, re released. Uh, okay, and then uh, Ed, it's good that you mentioned these uh, hundreds of uh, tests that we run across the cloud. So we had a little nice discussion, uh, which we, I would like to bring also here. Uh, we had it uh, on the on the morning Asia call. Okay, morning for me. Um, it's um, are we sure that we want to run all these cloud tests on each and every push of something so i know that we have some optimizations for um uh, re readmes and some insignificant uh, um, changes in uh, the documentation and script maybe but um still um i mean if i change something uh, 
in the network service manager, why do I need to test it across five clouds? Yeah, I mean, part of it is, so is the concern here the time it takes for the testing to run? Yes. Okay. Um, also, resource-wise, we are facing challenges. Like if I have five PRs running in parallel, they are very much exhausting all the resources that we have available and it becomes... Uh, Okay, so I mean, I, 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 I totally get that. And, and so like, ideally what you would like is a world where you have a bunch of unit tests that run well, that, that, that give you sufficient coverage and sufficient confidence that you think you will probably be okay um, and that those run quickly. And then you probably still wanna run the cloud testing CI um, on every merge on master. So you know who broke what when. Does that sound about right? I would slightly design my ideal world slightly di di different. Okay. So in my ideal world, um, when a developer uh, develops their, their PR, they, it's run against packet, for example, only, which will take X time, whatever that is. But I don't have to wait for some clusters to get uh, spawned in some cloud provider. Um, and then before I, as a maintainer or as a committer, before I merge it, I can press a button, whatever that button is, and then these tests get run against it. Alternatively, the developer can choose to run them themselves if they wanted to, but not against each and every push that they do. Um, uh, okay, so, so a little more human interaction in the CI is I think what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I like the notion of having knob, nerd knobs to control things. Yeah. But I, I think that even if we do have those, we need to have an automatic safe path. Meaning that if nobody presses the buttons or turns the knobs, um, we have a safish sort of thing that happens um, in the system. Because I, I, I fundamentally don't trust humans to do the mechanical bits uh -huh. right yeah. um, reliably. <clears throat> And so another, another option. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Please go ahead. I was going to say uh, another option is uh, for this problem when you have long running tests is that it might be another stage. So the cross cloud might be a third stage after your integration test stage. Say your integration test stage takes an hour or whatever. Your uh, cross cloud one, if each one is an hour or let's just say it's three hours, whatever, it queues. So if you have, um, five PRs, the first one might fire off, go all the way through, get all the way to the third stage, which is the cross cloud stage. And then it fires it off and no, oh, there's other people putting in PRs, doing commits or whatever, but okay, the queue goes ahead and takes the next one, or it might take the latest one, three hours in or five hours in or what have you, um, depending on what you wanna do. So that queue might be the answer as well. <clears throat> for this type of thing with long running tests to, to keep it automatic, like what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of what I was getting at is the, the reason we run CI is we want to reduce the probability of introducing bugs into the system. <clears throat> and we want to catch and isolate those bugs um, at, to where they actually, things actually broke um, as quickly as we can, right? And um, that, that's kind of the entire reason that, that you do CI, right? Is to, to, to make sure that the behavior of the system doesn't change unacceptably. Um, and there's always a trade-off here because you wind up with um, how long the tests run, which I agree you want to try and limit. And you also wind up with um, the simple acknowledgement that it's an imperfect system. So for example, you can get what I call the ships in the night problem where you've got PR1 and PR2, and PR1 and PR2 both pass the CI, and so you merge PR1, and PR2 merges clean, but it also it completely breaks shit, right? Say, you know, PR1 changed the name of a function, and PR2 added an invocation for that function, right? Now you are actually completely broken in a way that most CI systems won't catch. Now you can absolutely cause CI systems to catch that, by forcing every CI for a merge to pass on ahead before your merge, but that gets even more nasty in terms of timing and annoyance to developers. Um, 
So I, I think this is actually slightly germane to the conversation I wanted to have around paths, because one of the things I think will come out of the shifting of forwarders to uh, cross connects, um, as well as the path stuff, is that a whole lot of stuff becomes much more unit testable, much more reliably, um, because the system becomes much simpler to reason about. And so I'm, I'm it might be useful to, um, to also keep that in mind as we're talking about this, that, you know, maybe the solution is to get a system that is more unit testable um, for this. And then, you know, that'll allow us to do more things more easily and along the, the, the line of what you're talking about, Nikolai. Does that make sense? Um, yes, yes. I mean, uh, there is, I mean, like uh, even today in the call uh, that we did, we understand that it's not something that we can change from today to tomorrow. That's that's completely understandable. Well, it, it's it's something that can be changed, no question. Um, but I'd like us to figure out like what we think we're doing to change it. Of course. And, and obviously, it's not a switch flipping exercise because mm -hmm. we would have a lot of risk involved in just flipping a switch suddenly mm -hmm. um, on it. So I, I, what I'm hearing is, I think what I'm hearing is the testing is taking too long even as we bring in more optimizations. Um, we have had some issues lately with, it, with, with sort of a little bit of intrinsic flakiness that we're still chasing down. And we get those issues periodically. Um, and then, you know, effectively, I think I'm also hearing that we would like to have some nerd knobs available so that if something looks dangerous, you can apply a much more strenuous CI to it, um, or the developer can apply more strenuous C CI to it. Does that sort of capture the, the thoughts that have been described so far? Or are there other thoughts that people have on this topic? Because I know we have a lot of people who interact with the CI. <laughs> I'm really curious to see like what other, not only what other thoughts people have, but what other ideas people have. Are you guys still there? Yeah, we are. I mean, I'm fine with whatever we said. Maybe if someone else wants to add something. Yeah, so I'm trying to think. OK. So let's let's maybe brainstorm and revisit this next week. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably a good idea. It is. OK, but I do want to make sure we do capture this in next week's um, in, in next week's agenda, um, so we don't lose it. Yeah, can we can we get that as a to do list or a to do item on there? And uh, I'll spend some time thinking about this as well. Yeah, and and, and again, anybody, we we we're blessed to have a very broad set of experiences in the community, so you know we would like to draw on those. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Um... How do you to do thing? <laughs> I just stick it in uh just stick the word to do somewhere. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I a quick question. Who who added this operator for NSM? Oh uh, hello guys, this this was me. Um my name is Alex. Uh actually Al Al Alexandre, but uh you can call me Alex. Mm -hmm. I work for uh Red Hat. And I've been talking with Ed uh, for quite a while now about uh, building an operator to install the network service mesh. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you, if I can, I, I can actually talk a little bit about that. Or I don't know if you're going to follow the order on on your agenda, or if it was me. Yes. No, we, we can we can reorder it around, and this actually ties in really well with reconsidering our CI and cloud testing uh, sure. because. Uh, an operator would have profound impacts to to that. Sure. Um, okay. I will not move every, it here just to be, yeah. Cool. But uh, to be clear, not not everyone here will know what an operator is. And so if you could fill us in on that, that'd be fantastic. Of course. Of course. Yes. Um, 
Well, first of all, I, I work for the service uh, reliability engineering team that uh, builds actually uh, entitles itself as an operator enablement team. So our, our goal at Red Hat is actually to spread operators everywhere. Uh, we are trying to, to get uh, that community as strong as, uh, uh, as we can. And so to that question, what is an operator? Actually, an operator is a, a regular, we can say like that, a regular Kubernetes uh, workload but it actually uh, has as uh, the main goal uh, to regulate all the life cycle of your application, whatever application it is. So we, we, we kind of distinguish these two into operator and operand. So everything that is related to Kubernetes resources, may it be uh, uh, CRDs, custom resources, or may it be regular resources such as daemon sets, such as uh, deployments or, or whatever stateful sets, if you need like pod definitions, if you need to service accounts, everything can be actually automated by an operator. Uh, the first question that will probably uh, come up is, I can do that with Helm, right? Helm can do all of that. Yes, you can, because with Helm you can install, you can uninstall, you can upgrade. But once you get uh, inside uh, of the operator world, you will realize that you can do much more because operators are built, uh, can be built um, with the operator SDK, which is the, let's say, the easiest way of doing that. Uh, with Golang, uh, but also you can build uh, an operator with QBuilder or with Client Go and have uh, an extreme amount of flexibility to do whatever you want with your application. So then you can begin to bring in other steps such as backing up and restoring stuff. Uh, you can do high availability checks. You can do uh, intelligent metric collection, intelligent traces. And uh, uh, after that, you can do actually deep insights on your applications using the operator. You can expose a specific metric endpoints. And once you are mature enough, you can bring your operator to the autopilot phase, which can actually rebuild everything, change cloud providers, restart whatever you want because you are not dealing with only YAML files. You are inputting every single bit of your configuration through a custom API that is built uh, with that purpose. So an operator is basically getting uh, human knowledge that is used to, uh, let's say, manage the whole life cycle of your applications and put, put that into code. And once you have it, then you, 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 you can manage your application in a very automated uh, way. So it's kind of the way I, I define an operator. And, and that's it. Like uh, wh what we do actually is uh, as a team, we, we try to spread the operators around. Um, we have two big targets. Uh, one is the operator uh, hub IO. Uh, which is, if you if you want to check this, it's pretty cool because it will give you certain uh, visibility. I don't know uh, I, if I can share my screen here because I actually could could show that. So give me just a second here. So share. So do you have uh, any specific ideas of what you want to implement for NSM? That's Actually, I, I, have, I have a sketch of an operator already running and okay. installing. I, I copied your Helm chart. Let me share my screen here. And then, Can you all uh, see my, my screen here? I have a quick other question. How, okay. I mean, uh, how portable are these across the versions of Kubernetes? I mean, uh, can we consider that once we have an operator, it will require minimal ma maintenance while, while we upgrade, or it's just something that we need to babysit yeah, it's, all the time? No, 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 it's supposed to, to be completely uh, easy to install anywhere. Uh, and to me, it's, it's key because we don't want it only on regular Kubernetes, but also on OpenShift. So whatever you need to install the operator itself, it should work just fine. But 
one of the things that could actually make this operator really, really, really powerful is bringing in uh, another piece of code that is called the operator lifecycle manager that can actually uh, help uh, with versioning, with upgrades, uh, with even with downgrades if needed. Um, so yeah. that thing could, could take care of the whole life cycle of uh, your operator and, and the application. And also one thing that I think is, is really important to say is that looking into the NSM architecture, I, I spotted that you have two other applications alongside with NSM. One of them is Aspire and the other one is uh, uh, Jaeger Tracing. So those, those two guys could have their own operators, right? So the operator lifecycle manager could actually uh, take care of those dependencies. So you have a very app store like experience if you go to the maturity on that, because you can say, hey, my operator depends also on Spire and depends also on Jaeger. And immediately the operator lifecycle manager will install those for you previously uh, to have your operator running well and the, your operator will install NSM on top of it. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Uh, uh, so my question was more like now there is Kubernetes 117. Do I need to do anything to migrate the operator from 116 to 117? How? No, it's yeah, it's it's not tied to to a specific version, unless you were dealing with some big API changes and and you are using internally uh, an old API or something that is actually on the Kubernetes. Uh, versioning okay. is being broken. Yeah. It's, it's kind of it's kind of that. It is it is a very corner situation. It could happen, but it's a corner situation. Okay. In that case. Good. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have my screen here. It, it is on a very uh, I would say it's a very sketch sketchy uh, way yet. So here, let me see if I can have my uh, where is this? Um, okay. Let me. So operator. The operator, I can run the operator, the operator from the operator SDK on my local machine. So I'm, I'm running that. It, it is talking to a Kubernetes, uh, a Kubernetes uh, API that is already configured here. So I'm just actually running straight from the root of my project. And I have a, a, a quick, uh, a few watches here looking into that Kubernetes stuff. Uh, Aspire is already uh, deployed. I did that by, by hand using Helm. So uh, there are a few things that I'm troubleshooting yet, but if I apply uh, the CR that I built here for NSM, it should, it should deploy everything. It, it, it will spit a little, a little bit of, a, of some error messages because it still doesn't have some objects in. Uh, everything is, is coming up here, if you can see. Uh, the pods are here. I have like uh, the admission web who are coming up here. My accounts are all here. Um, I have a the daemon set coming here. I'm still troubleshooting this last container on your network service manager. There is something related probably to permissions. I don't know what happened, but it's almost there. It's a very, it's in the very beginning of it. So, it is it is quite straightforward. Uh, I can I can actually post on the chat uh, the link to my GitHub to for you guys to take a look. It is really really uh, in the very in the very beginning, but pretty much that's the for what uh, that you have to, to do once the operator is running. You just need to apply your CR. And how does it look? Uh, how does the CR looks like? If I look here uh, on my uh, CRD, CRDs folder, I can take a look on the CR, uh, okay, here. So this is a copy of your Helm values, give it or take, okay? So if, if we look on, on apart from, from the CR, which is taking the specs, uh, it's coming from uh, the API that was built. I can, I, I can have a, a separate session on that because uh, it would take a long time. But uh, we could look into two specific uh, pieces of the API. One is the one that builds the CR, which is this one, which is the NSM spec. And on the NSM status, I have nothing. Actually, I need you guys to, 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 to make some understanding here and to see what you wanted to see on your NSM object. 
So what happens when I do that is that if I come here and I say cube CTL get NSM, I will have an object. And if I want to describe that object, okay, I will see everything that is configured, right? So my spec is here. I could have a status field from, from that particular piece that I, I just showed where I can see everything, services, endpoints, how it's configured, what is delivering. So, uh, and this with just uh, a few lines of code, like two, two weeks, give it or take uh, on my free times here and, and some of my working time, uh, building an operator, so. You actually, uh, you actually raised a super interesting question about what actually makes sense to put into status. Exactly. Um, because I did just the ability for people to, in a straightforward way, see the status of the system um, as a system is, you know, independent of all the other good things that, that are done um, is actually really cool. Um, so we would definitely want to think about like, what is a meaningful status of the system? <clears throat> I'm sure. not sure yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. To me, to me, it's pretty hard. Yeah, to me, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to, to to actually know uh, upfront everything. So what I can do to, to help you guys and contribute with that is try uh, to have a brainstorm on that and bring you on the next meeting something on the status. We can try to evolve little by little. And uh, my question at, at this point is, I don't know if I showed you guys, let me show you something else here real quick. So uh, I don't know if I can, let me see if I can. Let, let, let me just uh, change this or oh. um, let me just, I, I'll try to stop sharing and, and bring another screen, just, just a second. Um, so let me bring the other one in because my, my um, kind of, um, okay, now, okay. I think I can, yeah, I think I can share again now. Yeah, because I have, I have two monitors here and I've kind of lost, I, I, I get lost sometimes. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, where is that one? I think it's my desk. Tree. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, it's the desktop tree. Can, can you see the, these guys? Yep. So, yeah, so this, this is the, the, the OpenShift Operator Hub. So let's say that I can see uh, NSM here. Mm -hmm. uh, a developer would just type something like, I don't know, I could get anything from like Spark, for example, which is a popular one. So I'll have Spark here. I can click there. I can see an install thing here and I can have a total UI on that. I can put some configurations on top of that. Uh, That's very I can nice. Yeah, I can build fields here. I can and can do a lot of stuff. I can configure NSM from here, from for someone that is so, not. So we, I, so, I think a lot of us here totally get that operators are wonderful. That's part of why I was so excited when you um, when you sort of showed up, um, yeah. because operators have been one of those things that we just haven't gotten to, but we've sort of known that we wanted for a long time. So we're super excited um, that you're willing yeah. to help. Is is um is, is there anything that we can provide in order to, to like, do you want to build an operator for us or are you looking to help someone in the community build an operator? Like what, uh, like how do you want to, to proceed? Yeah, well, well uh, in my point of view, um, my big role would be to kickstart the project. Uh, I don't need to keep that on my GitHub account. I would gladly uh, uh, leave that for the NSM org or network sub smash GitHub. It's not a problem to me. I uh, would kickstart the project and bring and, and bring people in. If I can help in, in any sort, any kind of thing like technical stuff, if we can, we can do even like uh, workshop sessions on how to build that thing and how to do, we can do that online. Uh, we can help with anything and, 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 and kind of empower the community to do the operator by, by itself, not only me, one guy developing is it's not, like the, 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 I think the strength of open source is actually bringing people in. So yeah, you would, yeah, we, we, we completely, yeah, we're very okay. well aligned with this. And so, yeah, let's, let's, let's consider that. So um, how about we do this? Uh, ping me, uh, ping me off uh, on Slack, uh, we're on CNCF uh, Slack. 
And uh, let's let's discuss what the right shape of this looks like. Like, does it need to be a, be a private repo? Should it be in the in the main repo itself? And so okay. let's go over some of the, the details on this, and we can and we can work on uh, if we want to schedule something for people in the community. If you want to go over that, uh, we can set sure. up we can some extra time. And we would love to have we would love to have you kickstart this bigger thing. Uh, one thing that I will uh, also uh, mention towards this. So our heuristic when we build uh, NSM is that we have we try to build it with uh, with no single point of failure. So like. If your data plane dies, we can repopulate the data the, the data plane with its information to continue. If the manager dies, we can ask the data plane and the clients and the peers saying like, what do you think of the state of the world? And then come back to a consensus. So one thing, and this is something we're gonna be very careful with on the community to, to help progress this forward is uh, that we uh, make sure that we build our operators with the same with, with with the same sense and i know operators are generally in this direction um but but that's also something that we want to just make sure that we don't uh that, that we don't relax that uh that style of thinking um yeah. But yeah with that definitely get a get a hold of hold of me and i'll um and i'll start helping with with trying to write, work out whether the right place to to do this uh, is and we can create new repos or or set it up how however it needs to be done Sure, sure. Uh, I can totally do that. Uh, just this, uh, a quick thing. This is the operator hub. I don't know if you guys, this is a community one that is outside of OpenShift. So it's there for the whole community, Kubernetes community, any version of Kubernetes. So just for you to get, uh, see if you want to take a look on the operator hub, hub.io, it's kind of the same uh, experience and we try to match those two. Right. Cool. Um, okay, so and, yeah, go ahead. So I apologize. We do have a couple other important things on the sure. on the agenda. So sure. we have to move towards that. But like, thank you very much. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, I will just stop sharing now. Cool. Thanks, uh, Ed. Can you uh, jump into the uh, the path changes? Sure. Let me go ahead and jump on that. Uh, let me share. So sharing Google Chrome. Can everyone see the share? Cool. Yeah. So we, we, had, we had talked a few weeks ago about wanting to move to um, consolidating the forwarder as a cross-connect network service um, to simplify the overall operation of network service mesh. Um, and so in the course of doing that, um, looking at that refactoring, we had to rethink how our healing was done. Now, our, our current healing is very complex, and it sort of involves a lot of the fact that for cross-connects that the forwarders were quite a bit different um, in some ways, even though the APIs were semantically similar. And now that they're becoming more like the other elements of the system, we needed to rethink the healing and hopefully rethink it in a way that's simpler. And in the course of that rethinking, this sort of path concept emerges. And let me, I'll walk through it in stages, right? So if you look at the current state of the system, we've got the network service mesh stuff, the network service stuff, where you can have a network service request which has a connection and a list of mechanism preferences. And that's passed either to a request, which returns a connection, or you can close a connection. Um, and those are the, the simple basic APIs. And when you look at the connection, you've got its ID, the network service that it's addressing, the um, mechanism, the connection uh, context, possibly labels. You've got a repeated list of network service managers. Uh, that it may pass through, and you got a string for the endpoint name and a state. Um, and so the proposal is, number one, leave the network service API alone, right? So if the existing API doesn't change. You still have a network service request that requests a connection, mechanism preferences, gets passed to a request that returns a connection, and you can close a connection. So that all remains the same. But then, um, then you have a you introduce what I'm calling a path. Now I'll start over here on the connection. Effectively, you replace the repeated network service managers with this path element. And you no longer need the state. So if you come around to the path element, a path is an index that points to a repeated, or in other words, a, a list of path segments. Think of a, a repeated in, in protobuf as an array. And so the index 
points to a particular element in this past segment that tells you where in the path you happen to be at this moment. And then the past segment itself is a name. This is analogous to, this is basically the name of the network, the thing that is providing the request API, which if it's a network service manager would be the name of that network service manager. If it's a forwarder, it would be the name of the forwarder. If it's a network service endpoint, it's the name of the network service endpoint. The ID is the connection ID that was issued by that entity for this past segment. And then we have two tokens associated with it. We have a request token and the request token is set by the requester and it's an authentication token. Think of it as a spiffy uh, ID document that says, here's who I am. And you get a response token back and when the return path, you get a response token in the past segment which basically is inserted by the guy who's the endpoint that's accepting your connection. And the response token you can think of as an authorization token. And the reason that's there is you want to be able to re-request um, in the event of some difficulty or in any number of events that I'll get to shortly. And so an example of this would be, um, you could have something where index zero pointing to the first element in the past segments and then your past segments could be, well, first I went through the network service manager who you know, successfully went through a forwarder, the forwarder handed it back to the network service manager and the network service manager handed it off to um, the network service endpoint. These are all the IDs that were issued by each of these for their connection. And so you have sort of an end to end picture flowing back through the return path of exactly what the path is being taken here. And this path can be extended through chains of NSCs if need be, if that is actually a thing that logically makes sense. So for example, we have passed through NSCs where that might be a good idea. And then a quick notion about path token expirations. Uh, any good JWT token has an expiration claim. So both the request token and the response token are always going to have an expiration. Uh, the request token expiration is set by the requester, the response token by the responder, um, and the one thing that has to be true about these is they've got to have values that expire before the underlying cert or identity expires because those also have expirations. So they should always expire before they become invalid, in other words. Is all this making sense so far? Uh, yep, I, yeah. Okay, so when we talked about the forwarder stuff, we jumped to an activity diagram and it turns out that, uh, I've got one here I wanted to walk through. It turns out that this ends up being fairly simple and it turns out that auto healing, is, very robust auto healing can be a, a, an emergent property of the underlying system. So this is an, the activity diagram and it starts here and the presumption is this is either starting because you're a leaf client who wants a network service, but um, this could also be where you start if you're starting as a, um, a pass through thing like a network service manager or a forwarder or a pass through NSC as well. So whatever it is you do to compute your request, you do that for the, the, you know, the endpoint you're going to send the request to. And you make sure to append a new pass segment to the path. And in doing so, you have to increment the path index. And then you set the request token in that path segment. You send that request to the endpoint, which receives the request. It does whatever processing of the request it's going to do. This might include extending the path um, to you know, a request that it sends as a client to someone else using exactly the same flow you normally get in the client. Presuming that that works out well, so we're not going into the error case. Um, your past segment, you know, you want to set the past segment name to be the name of the network service endpoint, which also could be the name of the network service manager if it's acting in that role of the forwarder. You set the past segment ID to whatever ID you've issued for the connection, and you set the past segment response token um, for this past segment. And at this point, that re this red bar uh, is essentially a fork. So the normal process becomes you return the connection because you've done your work at this point. Now the forking piece, and you can see this being done with a go routine, um, is you come down here and you say, look, I'm going to wait for either the response token to expire or the request token to expire 
or to receive a close. And if any one of those things happens, I'm going to close the connection. And what this means is that the connection, and we'll see how this is going to be okay in a moment, the connection is going to expire unless either, um, unless I receive a, a refreshment of the request or response token by getting a new request from the client. This means that your request, if the client dies, you're always gonna have your connections cleaned up eventually. So going back to the client, we return to the client its connection. It receives that connection, presuming that it does not actually receive an error. We come to another sort of fork point here. This little uh, circle with an X through it means that we're done with the flow, which basically means whatever function we call to do this, we're gonna return from. But we also then can run a go routine that either waits for the halfway point of the request token or the halfway point of the response token or for monitor connection to indicate that we're missing a connection from the endpoint because it was deleted or missing. Um, and that comes back up around here to resetting the past segment request token and resending the request and we fall through again. Questions at this stage? I do have some examples in the slides that will hopefully make this easier to follow. Uh, let's get to the examples. Okay, so here's the first example. It's very simple. You've got a client at an endpoint. The endpoint restarts, right, which means it's lost all its state. So the client, its monitor connection, uh, monitor connection, um, so it's monitor connection. Its monitor connection uh, eventually reestablishes a connection to the endpoint that's restarted, and it gets an initial state transfer. The initial state transfer lacks the connection that it was expecting, um, but it believes it has with the endpoint. So the client simply resends the request, including its path to the endpoint, and gets back in return a connection. So essentially, if the endpoint loses a connection, the client discovers the connection is missing and asks for it again. Now, a, a more complicated, and then the, the other simple example is the client dies. So if the client dies, then eventually the request or response token for the connection is going to expire and it will be closed and the endpoint will clean up the connection. So the more interesting example is sort of like this. This is a more uh, normal flow, right? You get a client, it serves something to the sends something to the network service manager. That's one, two, the network service manager sends it to the forwarder. Three, the forwarder sends a request to the network service manager and then the network service manager sends the request to the network service endpoint. And there's negotiation along these steps and each one results in a connection. Um, now let's say the network service manager restarts, right? So if the network service manager restarts, well, the client is going to learn that its initial straight, from its initial state transfer that connection one is gone. So it's going to restart its request process with the network service manager. The network service manager is going to then send a request to the forwarder. Um, the forwarder is going to treat that as if the connection was being refreshed with a new request token. And it's going to go ahead and refresh its request token and send that on to the network service manager again, which has never heard of this connection, by the way. So he's going to go process it through normally and send that on to the network service endpoint. The network service endpoint is still running, but it's going to treat this as if it's a refreshing of the token uh, for its connection. And so it doesn't think anything has gone wrong. So the only element in here, you know, effectively, that is aware that anything has necessarily gone wrong in this case is the network service client. Now in parallel, the forwarder also has a connection that it expects it's a client for to the network service manager, which is three. And it may also discover that that connection is missing and may also, re you know, re then re-request it. But again, everyone else in the chain is going to treat this as if it were a, um, a refresh of the token. And so it doesn't feel strange or abnormal. You know, you just simply issue a new response token and return back the connection and you're good to go. Does that help? Does that example help a bit more, Nikolai? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Um... I just wanted to note for the recording that uh, effectively this is happening in the future world where the forwarder uh, 
is not uh, just another component uh, from the basic deployment. It is just uh, implementing a specific network service. Yeah, no, it, that, that's absolutely true. In fact, it's, it's sort of requisite for that because mm -hmm. um, yeah. we have to have healing, right? And this is essentially a simple way to get to a generic set of healing um, in the system. Um, so dropping back really quickly, I, I actually have slides in here that link to all those. Dropping down to the last one with advantages. So this is a huge simplification of our healing. It uses a single behavioral flow everywhere, um, which means that we can write some very small components that can be used in forwarders, network service managers, network service endpoints to do, you know, pass through network service endpoints, et cetera, to do healing. Um, it's robust as a property of the system. So it, it can heal if all the components, except for the leaf client restart. So you can restart all the network service managers and all the forwarders and it will succeed in healing. Um, healing only flows backwards, not forwards, not backwards. This ends up being really simplifying. And healing is indistinguishable from token refresh if you're the endpoint. So you can't actually tell the difference between the guy be before you died or the guy before you is, is, you know, is part of a healing chain and the guy before you decided to refresh his token. They look exactly the same to you. Um, from a security point of view, this actually increases our security greatly because connections expire unless, they're, unless their tokens are refreshed. So unless you get a new authentication token before it expires, um, in, you know, in a, a, a request, you will expire the connection. So if, if authorization expires or authentication expires, the connection expires. Um, connections are only in place uh, for currently valid cryptographically authenticatable identities, because if the identity expires, you will naturally expire. Um, and connections are only in place if permitted by the policy at the time of the latest refresh. So if you alter your policy about admitting a connection, then the next time there's an attempt to refresh the connection, that will fail um, and the connection will go away. So and this particular point is super important as well because it turns out that this type of refreshing is really difficult to do in practice. In fact, it's a very manual process of analyzing ACLs and working out what applications you break. So this is like absolutely huge in the security space. Yep. And then from a robustness point of view, connections do not get torn down unless they expire. Right. So if I'm a endpoint, until that connection expires, I am always available to have someone heal that connection. So we have to worry much less about the timing of, of healing. Um, so if, for example, you were to issue tokens with a 10 minute lifetime, um, then you can get a fast healing if the client, if, you know, some, some element comes back quickly, you will heal quickly. But if some element comes back slowly, say for some strange reason, it takes minutes, like two or three minutes, you can still heal um, without having to put complicated timers in there that end up essentially putting the moral equivalent of weights in the system. So thoughts, questions? I wanted to sort of float the idea and see what people thought. So uh, by, by connections expire, um, does that mean that uh, the client should resend uh, in some certain, I don't know, uh, time frame its connection requests? Absolutely. So you remember when we came back here, having received our connection in the return for, as a client? Mm -hmm. so this column is the client. Um, you know, we hit this fork point, right? One half of it goes and forks and returns from whatever asks for the connection, but the other goes and runs a Go routine that resends the request that at the halfway point of expiring either request or the response token, whichever is sooner, um, comes back up here, sets a new request token with a new expiry and resends it. Mm -hmm. So I guess the drawback here is that there's going to be a lot more requests going on, right? <laughs> Depends on what the timers are like. You know, yeah. so if you had a 10 minute timer, then you might send a re-request every five minutes if you had a 10 minute expiry. Mm -hmm. And is there some, uh, some drawback again for scaling, for example? I mean. 
Yeah, it, it really, from a scaling point of view, it comes down to how many requests do you expect to receive? So for example, if I'm a node, and I'm a network service manager on a node, um, a node's typically scaled to run about 100 pods. Um, if you presume each of those 100 pods, you know, for some bizarre reason has five connections going, um, then you're talking about 100 new requests per minute for the refresh. If you've yeah. got 10 minute timers, um, 100 requests per minute is a relatively doable thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's definitely something where you want to think about scale. No question. Um, no question. Cool. Um, anything else? Any other questions? I know we're terribly over and I'm sorry for keeping folks. I just want to add something uh, really quick. Uh, so um, when you add and uh, we as a community speak about healing or this, being able to react to failures. I would just like to point out to uh, the opening keynote for KubeCon North America by Dan, where he was saying that failures are here and uh, we need to provide an infrastructure that uh, is able to cope with them. So that's yep, what you do. Absolutely. Cool. All right. I'll talk to you guys next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.